Look at verse 30. It says, then they departed from there and they passed through Galilee and they didn't want anyone to know it. You ever gone on that secret cruise mission to Fred Meyer's late at night trying to avoid everybody? <laughs> if you're real smart, you're gonna go to Safeway and you avoid everybody. I don't wanna see anybody. I'm hiding out. Jesus leaves there. It doesn't say where there is. You gotta go back a little bit. The there back a little bit is when Jesus healed the possessed boy the boy that had suicidal tendencies, real issues, family drama. From the beginning of his childhood, there was tension and problems in this house. Listen, and finally, when the dad, when the dad heard about Jesus, he went to bat for his son, and he ran to Jesus. He didn't find Jesus right away. Jesus was out on a mission with the three amigos up at the mountain of transfiguration. And so the dad went to the nine other disciples and said, hey, can you heal my son? And they did their best. <sighs> you ever just do your best and it's not enough? At least not yet. And the Lord shows up and says, I see you, I got you, I'll care for you, I'll finish what I began in you. And Jesus showed up and began to then intercede on behalf of this boy, casting out this demon. And then he gave that lesson we learned last week. This kind, this genos, this species, this race of demons, it's a special kind, according to Jesus. <laughs> it doesn't come out, except through prayer and fasting. It's big time. Jesus could snap his fingers and they're all gonna do whatever he wants them to do. But in that, we learned a lesson of spiritual readiness and preparedness. Jesus' disciples are now walking with him from this. Now, before this happened, there was the mountain of transfiguration. And before the mountain of transfiguration, eight days prior, they were at Caesarea Philippi, up north, where there was the mountain of transfiguration, where Jesus was trans... I'm sorry, that's not true. Well, up north, Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? And there was revelation and confession and keys given and names changed. All this is happening and now Jesus walks there and he avoids Galilee in order that he wouldn't be brought into conversations in order that he wouldn't be distracted. Now, I would imagine that Jesus is peopled out at this time. People everywhere and demons and family troubles and his boys. How many of you guys ever get peopled out? Raise your hand, you ever get peopled out? You say, I don't want, you all get people, you know why you get peopled out? Here's why, because you're not Jesus. Jesus isn't peopled out here. I get peopled out, you get peopled out. It's normal, it's natural, be careful. Self-care is important, rest. You gotta have some recovery time. Jesus avoids Galilee, though. My first thought was he must just be peopled out. And I sensed the Holy Spirit rebuking me last night. I say, why would you say that? I said, well, because I'm peopled out right now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and I just sensed the Lord say, do you think I get peopled out, Luke? And I was like, I no. No, you for sure don't. Well, then why would you avoid Galilee. And I sensed the Holy Spirit speaking to me last night because I avoided Galilee because Jesus knew what his mission was. I know that because the very next verse, look at verse 31. It says, for he taught his disciples and said to them, the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of men and they will kill him. And after he's killed, he will rise again on the third day. But they didn't understand the saying and they were afraid to ask him. Jesus avoids Galilee and maybe they're asking, hey, hey wait, wait, we're, not, we're not going to Galilee. We're not gonna go to Galilee? Oh man, I kinda, I'm from Galilee. I was hoping to grab some new socks, you know, hoping to go home for a second. And Jesus says, no, no, we gotta stay focused because the son of man is gonna be betrayed. He's gonna be crucified and on the third day rise from the dead. Why was Jesus avoiding certain things? Because he was focused in on mission. He wasn't peopled out. He was hyper-focused. And let me just speak that to myself and to some of us here. We have a group of people, introverts and extroverts. And every introvert here is gonna be tempted at some point in their life to do less because they're so overwhelmed. Every extrovert here is gonna be tempted to do more because you're addicted to doing stuff and you get FOMO, fear of missing out. And yet what every introvert, every extrovert here needs to do is to stay hyper-focused on the mission that God's given to you. Don't get caught up in all the silly things. And I wish I could rebuke all the introverts, but I'm not one, so I'm not gonna go there. I don't know what it's like to be an introvert but I can rebuke all the extroverts, all the ones who get too busy and do too many things and find themselves spinning their wheels and unable to accomplish the things that God's asked them to do because they're just too busy. And Jesus here, neither extrovert nor introvert, was hyper-focused on his mission. What if we did that? 
What if we didn't get so distracted, so disillusioned, so disappointed, so disoriented by the things of this world? What if we really were? Maybe this is just a word that the Holy Spirit was speaking to me last night as I was assuming Jesus is peopled out. He's like, he's not peopled out because the very topic on his heart is death, burial, and resurrection. He's so focused on the mission. Do you know you're on mission right now? That's the first question I gotta ask the introverts and the extroverts. Because if you don't know you're on mission, oh man, you're gonna be all messed up in whatever camp you live in. You're gonna be hyper doing other stuff and hyper distracted, hyper disoriented. And I believe the Lord is saying to me and to us, as the signs and the times are increasing, as the days are not getting lighter, they're getting darker, guys, it's time to focus. It's time to know your mission. It's time to keep going. Now I say that because when he said that, the red letters to the disciples, what did they say in return? <laughs> they didn't understand. They're listening to him, they're like, do you know what he's talking about? No, I don't know what he's talking about. What should we do? Act tough. They're like, mm-hmm, sounds good, mm-hmm. <laughs> you ever been in a big meeting before where you start to get distracted and you're not listening anymore, and finally somebody looks at you and says, you know what I'm talking about? You're like, totally, dude, totally. I got you. And you have no idea. I love this. The disciples, they hear him. They don't understand, but they're not gonna ask questions. They don't wanna look dumb. I've died. This is like my life. Just don't, just keep your mouth shut. You look less dumb, you know? Why open your mouth and prove that you're dumb? Why, why ask dumb questions? <laughs> Poor disciples here. They didn't know what he was talking about. Maybe it was they didn't like what he was talking about. I think we can definitely assume that because just about a week earlier, Jesus said, who do you say that I am? You're the Christ, the son of the living God. You're the Messiah. <laughs> we found him. This is so sick. This is gonna be so rad. And he starts immediately talking about his death. They're like, dude, that's not our plan. That's not the way we want our lives to go. You're the Messiah. We've been hoping for the Messiah forever. The Romans are horrible. Please kill them first and then set up your kingdom. Don't mind if you hire us as your, your A squad, your A apostles, not the B apostles. And they had all these ideas. And Jesus just keeps talking about weird stuff. <sighs> death, burial, and resurrection. It didn't fit their narrative. By the way, why did Jesus uh, in this moment, he's, he's preparing them for the death, burial, and resurrection. They're just not listening. Maybe they're not asking questions because they actually knew what he was saying, but they didn't want to go any deeper. You ever do that before? You can kind of track what's happening in your marriage or track what's happening in your, your, your boss at work or your kids. You can kind of see what's going on, but you don't really want to dig any deeper. You're just hoping this will just go away and fix itself. I don't want to probe and actually open this up. But Jesus here is hyper-focused, and I believe he's speaking about his death, burial, and resurrection, because as much as they wanted deliverance, as much as they enjoyed the power, as much as Peter wanted to build some tabernacles, let's just stay here, this is so sick, what we're doing. And the Lord looked at him and said, we're not staying here. We're going down. And as soon as they went down, what did they find? Chaos, battles, devils, division, depression, suicide, all kinds of issues. Jesus deals with it and heals, and immediately he avoids Galilee to stay on mission. Where's he going? Jerusalem, to die. The rest of our story from the book of Acts will continue to show Jesus making his journey toward Jerusalem to die. This is not the agenda of the disciples. This is not what they want. And yet why in this moment do you suppose Jesus began to talk about these things? I suppose it was because it was right on the heels of seeing the devastation of this family in duress. You ever have those good days, those great days where it's so great you kind of forget spiritual warfare is a thing, you forget that heaven's real because it's like real cool here on earth. Then there's those other days you go through something where all you can do is hope for heaven. Loss in the family, loss in your community, ultra suffering, and all of a sudden you're thin and you can sense heaven and you're into it. You're pumped on it. You're excited about it. I think Jesus began to talk about his death, burial, and resurrection on the heels of this demonic attack on purpose because that was what he came to do, to kill the devil, to set people free, to liberate the captives. The Bible actually says in Colossians chapter two that when Jesus died on the cross, that he made a public spectacle of the devil with the blood of the cross, having nailed to it your handwriting of requirements, my sinful condition. Jesus came for that hyper focus. I'm not here to make things better. I'm not here to make dead guys better. I'm here to make dead guys, dead women come alive. That's what we're here to do. And Jesus, I believe, is showing us this, leading this mantra, leading this way, but they didn't get it. They don't understand. 
Uh, verse 22 or 32, but they didn't understand his saying and they were afraid to ask him. Can I just say this? The Bible tells you and me multiple times, ask, seek, and knock. Humble yourself. Maybe it's sometimes we don't want the answer. Maybe there's a faith issue in our lives. I just, I gotta figure it out. God's not really gonna give to me what I need. He's not gonna lead me. He's not gonna care for me. You ever just feel that way? You're on your own. Maybe it's not so much that God doesn't love you or care for you, but God's so busy. He's so busy, I'm just gonna have to work this out on my own. The Bible specifically says to you and me, humble yourself, ask, seek, and knock, and he'll lead you and guide you. I'm glad this is happening right now because I do the same thing where I don't necessarily know what to do but to reach out to him. Look what happens next. This is so hilarious. We're gonna finish this chapter, guys. We got to hustle. Look at verse 33. It says, then he came to Capernaum, which is outside of Galilee, in that region in northern Israel. And when he was in the house, he asked them, saying, what was it you disputed amongst yourselves? But they kept silent. You ever had those conversations with your kids at home? They kept silent, for on the road they had disputed amongst themselves who would be the greatest. Stop right there, eyes up here. They get home to Capernaum, they're all kind of just unpacking their bags. It's been a road trip. Jesus sits down and just stares at them. He says, hey, what are you guys talking about back there? I mean, it's a clear question. <laughs> it's not a trick question. You ever been in the car ride with your mom or dad where the dad looks at you through the rearview mirror and says, wait till we get home. Just wait till we get home. <laughs> and Jesus waits till they get home. It says that when they got in the house, I believe this was Simon Peter's house. If you ever get the chance to go to Israel, they've actually discovered where Simon Peter lived there with his mother-in-law, and they have the house there. Uh, it's all preserved. The Catholic Church bought the site there. It's a site there in Capernaum, and they actually built this crazy spaceship over that site there. It looks like a spaceship. It's this big building with pillars all the way around it and a glass bottom, so you can go stand right over Peter's house and look at it like a tourist would do. It's amazing sights right here. And I believe Jesus gets to this house, he's hung, hunkered down, and he asks them this searching question, guys, what were you talking about? And they don't wanna say it. Because somehow, some way, as they were journeying with Jesus, they got distracted by all the things that had just happened, and they found themselves arguing with one another who's the greatest. Now, I don't know how the conversation started. I don't know how the argument was going. Were they advocating for themselves? Were they advocating for one another? Was it Peter, James, and John, the three amigos who had just come down from the mountain of transfiguration? And maybe the other nine were saying, hey, guys, what did you see up there? Classified. I'd tell you if I could. You wouldn't believe it if I told you. I don't know. And maybe they were flexing and posturing. It'd be hard not to. And Jesus, what's his focus? What's his topic of conversation? His soon coming sufferings. And they're talking about how great they're gonna be. Maybe it was the fact that they were dealing with all these people that were coming to them and they had to avoid Capernaum or, or Galilee because their popularity was growing. Maybe they were arguing over who was the greatest because they just found themselves failing and they're wondering who's actually in charge here and what's happening. Be that as it may, pay attention as we focus on five things that Jesus reveals to these guys in light of this question. Because instead of laying into them, which I would have done, guys, I'm going to die. You're arguing about who's the greatest? Get your head in the game. That's what I would have said. But Jesus quietly, what were you guys talking about? Because he's like a loving dad. A loving shepherd. As a matter of fact, what he's gonna do next is he's gonna sit down. And when a rabbi would sit down, they would do so because it was important to listen. It was an important part of the teaching. And so Jesus here notices they're off track, notices they're not kind of seeing what's going on. They're not picking up what he's laying down. So instead of getting mad at him and laying into him and railing on him and rebuking him, he does something even better. He redirects him. He disciples him through it. <sighs> because have you noticed that no matter how far you are along in your journey, you still have some brokenness in you? No matter how much you've learned, no matter how much you've experienced, no matter how much you know about the scriptures, about the upcoming things, the world event, no matter how much, <laughs> we find ourselves drifting into silly convos, silly actions. We get ourselves off track. And I'm so grateful for this story because Jesus here knows it and instead of just letting it slide, boys will be boys, they'll figure it out. He says, what are you guys talking about? 
This is, by the way, how the word of God works. When you read the word of God, it searches your heart. It searches your mind. It knows and divides between thoughts and intentions and is able to reveal what's really going on. This is why the word of God is super scary in that way. If you're living a lifestyle that's duplicitous or double-minded, you're probably not opening up the book very often because it's just too scary. God reads your mail. But if you're wise today, a wise guy or a wise gal, you'll say, hey, you know what? I got brokenness. I wonder if I'm like a dumb sheep sometimes. I wonder if I've accepted things that are untrue and leading me into unprofitable waters or activities or actions. Lord, I'm gonna get into your word once again. Would you show me what's going on? so I don't get picked off, so I don't get led astray, so I don't become fruitless. And I believe Jesus does all this because he's hyper-focused and he wants his boys to be hyper-focused as well. And he asks them, what were you guys disputing about? Remember when God called out Adam and Eve in the garden? When they had sinned and fallen into rebellion and tried to cover it up with the fig leaves and walking around nakedly? Can you imagine those fig leaves suits that they just made? I don't think it was fig leaves, I think it was blackberry bushes. I think they're like, oh, this sucks. You know, like, what the and remember the question that God brought to Adam? Adam, where are you? Just like this question to Jesus to the boys, what are you guys talking about? He knew what they were talking about. God knew where Adam was, but he wanted Adam and he wanted the boys to start to think about, what am I doing? Remember when Jesus knocked Saul of Tarsus on the ground, shined a light in his face and pushed him around a little bit and he said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Uh, who, who are you? Lord, I'm Jesus Christ, whom you're persecuting. You need to course correct. You need to change direction. This is what the word of God does, gets our attention, and Jesus gives these guys a redirection. Now, remember, the context and content of their conversation was is who's gonna be the greatest. Jesus had literally called them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. When a rabbi would hand select you, it was kind of a big deal. These guys had been overlooked by previous rabbis, so this was their second chance, and Jesus loves to give people second chances. And he called them, oh man, this is crazy. He's gonna make us, and this wasn't just any old rabbi. Turns out this is the rabbi, this is the one. So for these guys to have this desire to be great in this misunderstanding that this is gonna go bigger than they could ever have asked, think, or imagine, is not wrong, I get it. But Jesus doesn't want them, he told the disciples this many times, I don't want you who are my followers to do it the way of the world. Don't be like the Gentiles and the kings that lord it over people. My kingdom is not one that lords over, my kingdom is one that comes under. And Jesus now gives these guys five principles that we're gonna see in the rest of the text here that, listen, will afford you greatness. They're gonna make you a great woman, a great man. Not according to the world's standards, but according to what God has revealed in his scriptures, what God has revealed in his kingdom. Settle into this right now. God has called you to be great eternally, not great temporarily. And we need to leverage our influence, leverage our capacity, leverage our position in life right now for the glory of God and the good of others. And this is what he says to do it. Check this out. He asks them, what are you guys talking about? Nobody says a word. Verse 35, and he sat down. And he called the 12, and he said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last. And the servant of all. Now, this must have hung heavy in the room. You guys wanna be the first of all? Then become the last of all. You wanna be the best of all? Then become the least of all. And somebody's writing this down, say, okay, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. If we wanna be the first, we have to be the last. And so Jesus here gives divine heavenly principles that are incongruent with our earthly ones. And to make an example of it and to teach this, Jesus the master teacher, verse 36 says, then he took a little child and he set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, receives not me, but him who sent me. Stop right there, eyes up here. First thing Jesus does is he grabs a little kid and puts him right in the middle. That little kid, they're staring at him. Now little kids in those days didn't have a voice. Kids were seen, not heard. They didn't have influence, they didn't have capacity, they didn't have authority. As a matter of fact, in those days, not our days, but in those days, kids were more looked at as possessions than people. And so Jesus, let me teach you guys a story. Let me teach you a lesson. He grabbed a kid and put him there. Then Jesus grabbed the little kid in his arms. First thing I gotta say to you is this. How do little kids respond to you? 
It's an interesting question. Apparently, Jesus had his way with little kids. They weren't afraid of him. They liked to be around him. You can tell a lot by a kid in the way he responds to people. I understand there's differences and there's stranger danger and all these things. But apparently, Jesus had a big heart and he liked to be around kids. This was not a cultural norm in those days. As a matter of fact, the disciples multiple times told the kids, hey, keep the kids away from Jesus. He's super busy. And Jesus said, did you just say that? We're about to have VBS the rest of the week. Get those kids over here. (laughs) Jesus putting clown paint on and having fun, getting in the bounce house with the kids. Get the kids over here. Teaching them a lesson. These guys are all jacked up. The way of the world, the brokenness of our nature. The first principle is this. If you wanna be great, okay, hang out with little people. And I'm not just saying kids, but anybody in our system that's marginalized, anybody in our culture that doesn't have authority, anybody in our culture that can't give you something back that you give to them, hang out with people that have nothing to offer you in return. Do you really wanna be great? Do this. Find other people in your world. Find other people in your life. Find other people at work and associate with them. Hang out with them. Jesus did this. Normal people in his day wouldn't do this. Business people, entrepreneurial people, kings, they wouldn't do this. Jesus says, okay, let me just teach you some principles. Do you wanna be the greatest? Find some people that can't influence or leverage greatness for you and you give them your best days. Why would we do that? Because I'm watching in heaven. And I'm gonna do for you what, no one could, what nobody could do for you. And I'm examining your heart. And I'm purifying your motives. And when you spend time with the homeless or the jobless or the ones who are marginalized, the ones who nobody sees, not only are you doing it to the Lord, but you're doing it to the people around you. And Jesus says, if you receive one of these, you receive me. And if you receive me, you receive not me, but him who sent me. I promise you, I love teaching Sunday school and have the opportunity or teaching the Antioch Christian training students, these young college kids. There's some families up there at the Antioch Christian training school that homeschool their kids. And so there's all these little kids around. So in the back row, one of the days, just the back row is full of all these little kids, snotty nose back there, drawing. Some had their Bibles open, listening to Pastor Luke, like, who is this guy? At the end of one of the sessions, one of the kids, he's about seven years old, walked up to me, passed everyone, walked all the way past, and he had this piece of paper that he had drawn, and it was a picture of me, and he gave it to me. This radical picture, this beard, and this Bible standing there with bloodshot eyes screaming. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's cool. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Jesus said the first principle is hang with little people. Serve the little people. Ask God what that means. Ask God how that looks in your life. If you truly wanna be great, this, you might not have the same opportunity, you might not have kids around you or something like that, but you can find some people that nobody else has given attention to this week. Go sit with them, love them. I promise you, you'll be purified, they'll be edified. It's the first step to greatness. The second step to greatness, let's keep reading. It says he sat down and he said, uh, verse 36, then he took a little child and he set them in their midst And he asked them, or had taken him in his arms, he said, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. The next principle is found in verse 38. It says, now John answered him, John, John and James, the sons of thunder. John answered him saying, hey, teacher, we saw someone who doesn't follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he doesn't follow us. (laughs) I think he was happy hey, we saw somebody out there that wasn't part of our crew out there healing people and preaching. Shut them down. (laughs) And Jesus starts looking around. He's like, am I supposed to give you something in return for that? Uh, But Jesus said, don't forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. And then he goes on to say, if they're for us, they're not against us. If they're gathering, not scattering, they're part of our team. Jesus rebukes him. Now, let me just speak a little bit to this. You want to be great? Not only should you hang with little people, but if you want to be the greatest person in the world, be bigger and more magnanimous than anybody. It's super easy in our culture, especially today. Maybe it's been easy in every culture to be critical, to be jealous, and to be judgy. There's a lot of people doing things differently than you right now. I wouldn't do it that way. You ever look at somebody? I wouldn't do it that way. I wouldn't raise my kids that way. I wouldn't lead my family that way. I wouldn't worship God that way. I wouldn't go on a mission trip that way. I wouldn't spend my money that way. And you find yourself dividing the opposite of being great. And what Jesus said here to John, hey, we saw somebody doing it different than us. They're not part of us, so we shut him down. Jesus said, I I don't know if I'd do that. 
Why don't you be more gracious and more magnanimous and let me deal with it? Why don't you stop being jealous and judgmental? Maybe they were ultra sensitive because they had just tried to cast out a demon and how well did that go for them? And all of a sudden they see somebody else doing it better than them. They're like, better stop that guy. He's making us look like a dummy. Examine your heart. I look at the church. I study the church. I read authors. And if I'm not careful, I'm reading an author. I'm like, mm, making fun of the guy who's reading it because I'm jealous of his ability to write. Or I'll watch another church locally or global kind of get blessed and expand. And I'll instantly start looking for the silly stuff. Well, they're just silly. They're just doing it this way. And the Lord says, why are you doing that? Because I'm the opposite of great right now being jealous, being critical, being judgmental. If you want to be great, be more magnanimous. Let the Lord figure it out. Remember that time Jesus taught the parable of the man who came in and sowed tares amongst the wheat? It was bad news. And the disciples volunteered. Should we separate the bad from the good and make, make sure we don't do it wrong? He said, no, let me do that. You're going to hurt stuff if you do that. Be more magnanimous. Be bigger. Trust me. If you want to be a great person, not only should you serve and hang with little people, but you should be bigger and magnanimous, full of joy. Don't be jealous, don't be judgmental. But also, he says in verse 42. Are we in 42 already? Someone's fast-tracking me. We're not in 42 yet. Verse 41. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. When you serve in this way, When you're magnanimous and just give a cup of water, you're going to find yourself being blessed because you're doing it as unto me. By the way, in our day and age, this isn't one of the principles you can write down, but just think this through. The more people that serve you, the greater you are. That's the way our world works. How many employees do you have? How many places of business? How many banks do you bank with? How many friends do you have? How many followers? How many people that serve you and know you and fan you and adore you? And and that's what we're known for. How many people, you know what Jesus said? Give more water away than you receive. Wouldn't it be radical is if you led, led your Christian life, I'm gonna see how many people I can serve before I die. I'm gonna see how many people I can impact. Not how many people I can get to serve me. Every single day I'm gonna serve as many people as I can, making eye contact, hugs, love, recognition, respect, humility. Well, I'm just gonna serve. Jesus, you might make an excuse at this time, especially if you're an introvert, I get it or even if you just have a calendar, I don't have enough time for everything, I don't have enough time for everyone, I don't have enough capacity. Jesus said, try it. Try now, give me. Give, and I will give back to you every single time. Don't be stingy, but instead be generous. Don't seek to be served, seek to serve. Verse 42, not only should we be hanging out with the little people and be magnanimous and bigger, but the third thing he says is be sensitive. You wanna be great? He says, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. The next couple of verses are gonna be real hardcore. I wonder if Jesus stood up in his teaching. I don't know. But as he looked at the disciples, if this was one monologue, Jesus looks at them. John says, we shut a guy down. And Jesus says, don't do that. Be bigger than that. Be gracious. And then he goes on to say, be careful not to stumble people. If you stumble one of these little ones, literally if you cause them to sin, better for you to have a millstone around your neck and go swimming than to do that at all. (sighs) Pause right there. I don't know exactly what Jesus is talking about. It's a huge principle though. In our Christian journey, the men and women around us, or maybe the men and women not near to us, but nearer, maybe one circle removed, be careful not to stumble them. Be careful not to cause their pathway to deviate or to veer. Jesus takes that very seriously. And I believe there's this idea of our Christian liberty being taken into consideration that if I have freedom to do this and freedom to do that and I do it because I'm prideful or because I'm stoic and it causes somebody else to stumble, don't do that. Paul actually said, I became a Jew to the Jews that I might save some. I became a Gentile to the Gentiles. When I was at that house where they weren't eating meat because they were offended because it was sacrificed to idols, I was a vegetarian that night. Yeah, I had pepperoni sticks in my pocket, but they didn't know. I didn't want them to know. I didn't want to stumble them. And really, if you want to be great, sometimes in our pride, our eloquence, our closeness to Jesus, we look at people that are different than us and less than us, and we just think they need to grow up and they need to be the stronger ones. Jesus said, if you want to be great, you're not going to stumble people. Be very careful of this. Be sensitive. We're going to call it that. If you want to be great, be sensitive. Don't be stumbling. People care for them. And then the fourth thing, that if you want to be great, Jesus gives us a series of verses here that are very serious. Look at verse 43. He says, hey, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. 
It's better for you to enter into life maimed, when he says life, he means heaven, rather than, into, or rather than having two hands and to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut your foot off. It's better for you to enter into heaven or life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched where the worm does not die and the fire's not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. By the way, the ushers have some forks here today for us, so... Uh, if it's better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The fourth thing, if you wanna be great, the first thing is hang out with little people and do it with joy. Do Sunday school. If you wanna be the greatest person here at South Beach Church, be on the Sunday school team. Fill out a form, volunteer, attend the eight, serve at the 10. Get on a rotation. Talk to Katrina, how do I do this? Am I qualified? Can you train me? Can you help me? And she will. Talk to Pastor Rory. When's your next youth event? Do you need helpers? It's Halloween. You got a youth, you got a youth thing? What do you guys need? Hay bales? What do you need? You need people showing up? Maybe it's not kids. Maybe it's just the people at the food pantry. People that are suffering, going through a hard time. I'm gonna go hang out. I'm gonna go give dignity to them. I'm gonna hang out with them. I'm gonna go to Agape Respite. They're opening up here soon here in Newport, helping people in our local community. I'm gonna serve. Hang with the little people, the marginalized people, and be magnanimous. Don't be so critical. Don't be so jelly. Don't be so judgmental. Stop that. I want to be a great person, not a small person. I want to be big. And also be sensitive. Careful with the people around you. Don't be so prideful. And fourthly here, the fourth principle, don't be an idiot. I made that up myself. Don't be an idiot. You got problems with your eyes, your hands, or your feet? Cut it out. Cut it off. Deal with it. Jesus said, that'll mess you up. When he talks about hell and their worm, not the worm, their worm, what he's saying is there is a real hell that lasts forever. And the person who goes to hell forever, there's gonna be a worm assigned to you. It's gonna plague you. Whatever your plague is, whatever your fear is, whatever your deal is, this is for people who do not repent and receive forgiveness from Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, if there's stumbling issues in your life, by the way, if you are saved, you're not going to hell, but you still need to cut it out. You still need to cut it off. Let me say something though. I do not believe, and maybe we could argue later, we can go to coffee, you buy, we can go to coffee. I do not believe Jesus is actually arguing for a literal cutting off of the hand, a cutting off of the foot, and a plucking out of the eyeball. I don't think so. Otherwise, we're all in sin because we all have all those things with us. I do know stories where certain people have read this, overwhelmed with the weight of their sin, and have found bandsaws and pitchforks and done stuff and mutilated themselves. That's not what the Lord's talking about here. Because check this out. Did you know that if you cut your hands off and cut your feet off and cut your eyeballs out, you can still sin? Anybody know that? Because the heart of the issue is an issue of your heart. But what I believe Jesus is saying is, you want to be great, do, do whatever it takes. Get radical. Get radical with the things around you because hell is real. Don't mess around with the things, with the, get your hands in trouble, or where your feet take you, or what your eyeballs take in. Get radical. And maybe that's a message for somebody here today. Hey, just do whatever you gotta do. Get, get fired up. Now's the time. Break the computer, delete the account, dump that person, stop going to that place. Get real. Now's the time. And Jesus says, do you guys want to be great? They're arguing over who's going to be the greatest. Hang with the little people. Be bigger. Be magnanimous. Be sensitive around the people. And don't mess with stuff. Last thing he says is this. He goes on and he finishes the text. And he says, for everyone who will, everyone will be seasoned with fire. And every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good. Unless you have high blood pressure. But salt is good. But if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. The last principle for being great in these days is to be salty. What he means by this, in this text, these two verses are very confusing to us because we weren't there. In those days when you would offer a sacrifice or when you would have a contract, they would season it with salt and that sacrifice. If you did a business deal, there would be salt involved. You would exchange salt and Jesus said in Matthew 5, salt is good. If the salt loses its flavor, how can it be useful anymore? Be careful. And I believe what the Lord is saying here is to be a person of integrity, to make sure that the things you're doing, the things I'm doing, are worth their salt. You know what the Bible says? It says there is a day when all the works done by Christians will be burned with fire. 
1 Corinthians 5. It's coming up soon, 1 Corinthians 3 and 1 Corinthians 5, where the Lord will look at your life and say, dude, that was so sick. You were saved by grace, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Come on into your glory. Now we're gonna go ahead and open up the files and see everything you did as a Christian. How much salt did you have? How much integrity? How much purpose? How much value? And there will be a bonfire. And the wood, hay, and stubble, the silly things that you and I have all done in our Christian journey will go up in smoke. For some of you, it will go up a little longer. You know. Wow, what were you doing, Pastor Luke? You know. <laughs> I love a good bonfire. And by God's grace, all the wood, hay, and stubble will just vanish. It'll be over in the precious stones and the jewels and the gold, silver, and the precious, all the beautiful things and the crowns. They will remain. And I believe what the Lord wants for you, wants for me. He's, he's gonna pay for all this. He's on his way to the cross. I'm gonna have the worship team come up. They're gonna lead us in a closing song. We're gonna respond. And we get to do these things this week. We get to hang with little people. The marginalized, the disenfranchised. Maybe it actually is a little kid, but maybe it's not a little kid, but somebody who has very little influence in this world. You say, I'm gonna give them my best days. Did you know that kids, generally speaking, when you give to a kid, they can't give you anything back? They actually just take more? Have you seen kids? I've got three of them. It's horrible. <laughs> the more you give, the more they take. It's crazy. Jesus said, yeah, that's my kingdom. Don't just live to receive. And be bigger this week. Be magnetic. Stop judging people. Oh, Lord, we saw someone doing something different than we did. We sh shut them down. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you needed to do that. Let it go. Stop picking on people. Be bigger, be gracious, pray for them. The Bible says if you see somebody stumbling towards fire, yeah, deal with it, go talk to them, pray with them, love them. Jesus said, that guy was preaching the gospel. Why would you pick on another church? Fan the flames. We do this every Sunday, you guys know this, we pray for our services and for other churches and for people to go to church. And I do this as a purifying effect on my own heart because I wanna be, I, I wanna deal with this stuff. To say you don't have any of this in your heart, it's kinda weird. You're just like the disciples. Man, I can't believe I was wondering how great I was gonna be. That's so weird. Lord, am I broken? Mm -hmm. Lord, am I deceived? Mm -hmm. Lord, am I distracted? Yep. Lord, are you mad at me? No. I'm mad about you. Why don't you guys all stand up with me? May the Lord convict us to be sensitive, to not be idiots. Wouldn't it be rad not to be an idiot? Not to mess with stuff that's gonna leave you burned, leave you empty, leave you crippled, leave you blind. Here's the deal. Jesus wouldn't have said any of these things unless they were able to be done. By his Holy Spirit, through his grace, he can change you even this morning. If you're not a believer here, he can save you. He can forgive you of your sins. He'll regenerate your spirit. He'll give you new hope, a new purpose, a new outlook, new want to's, new desires. And if you are born again, you are a believer here, you're saved by grace, filled with the Holy Spirit, but you're like the boys in the back seat, where do we get home? In the words speaking to you, Lord, oh, thank you, Jesus. Would you make us great? And Father, would you have your way even in this time of response the rest of the afternoon? Lord, I thank you for this text. Lord, I just, I'm gonna take these things so seriously. I'm gonna take this for a spin. <laughs> Lord, may it be our joy to take you at face value and to love, Lord, unconditionally like you did, to trust you. Maybe you're here this morning and you need special prayer. We're gonna be praying. I'm gonna have John and Lucy come up and they're gonna be praying on your left, my right. I'll be over here. If you need prayer, come to the altar and just kneel down at the stairs here. Worship the Lord. Ask him to change your heart. And I wanna give everyone an opportunity to respond. If you wanna just give your life to Jesus and receive from his Holy Spirit, and you wanna walk in these five principles, you wanna do these things, to a greater degree this week. And, and you know you want to, but you're gonna need his help. Would you just raise up your hand right now and say, yeah, Lord, I need your help to do this. I receive from you your Holy Spirit to do these things, to walk with little people, to find myself serving others and not being served, to be magnanimous, to be sensitive, to not be foolish, and to be salty, to be men and women of integrity. Say, yes, Lord, I'm going to do what you called me to do. We love you, Jesus. Receive our worship now. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Let's respond as the Lord would lead us.